The reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 21. We're starting to read at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. I'm here in our house in Pimlico and um, I'm living through these days with Mark and Hannah and um, with our friend James Emberley from the evening service who lives with us. And of course, also with Frank, who misses all of you, but um, especially the church biscuits, I'm afraid. So lots of love from all of us to all of you. and. Thank you so much for all the prayers and um, conversations and emails we've exchanged these past few weeks. Um, It's really made a difference to us here in the house. Um, We know that these exchanges are happening across the scattered church family. And so thank you. Thank you, all of you, for sustaining us in this way. Last week, I received um, a regular email, a mail shot from one of the London art galleries, and it had on it a photograph of um, a wall in Hong Kong with some graffiti on it. And um, the Chinese graffiti, when, when translated, says this, we can't return to normal because the normal that we had was precisely the problem. One of the refrains that has already emerged even in the early days of this pandemic is the question, how is this experience going to change us? This question comes up in private conversations between friends and regularly in public discussion. Every day the newspapers devote columns to speculating on how the world will change or, in their opinion, how the world must change after this season. And as we sit in the comfort and shelter of our homes and consider how this virus is playing out amongst the homeless in London and across the country, how it's playing out among those in dangerous domestic situations, among those in prisons, among those in refugee camps in faraway places, we find ourselves agreeing that this experience should and must change us. And while there is inevitably some apprehension as we contemplate change, what is more resonant in these conversations is the discovery that actually we have a deep, deep desire for change, a longing not just for an adjustment, but for a fundamental and permanent change that will really make a difference to how we live our individual lives, how we relate to one another, how nations and governments operate, how the world operates. What's resonating louder than fear in these conversations is a hope that this situation which has come to us with nothing of our own doing, will be the game changer for our generation. In other words, we want the fallout from this epidemic to bring about the change we all desperately wanted, but were powerless to bring about. Yes, we may fear change because change is always disruptive, but at this time, we find that our greater fear is that we will emerge from this unchanged, that when this is all over, we will just return as individuals and as a world to the way we were before. On a personal level, that yearning for change may express itself in questions like, when this is all over, 
do I really want to return to the old pattern of work that exhausted me and that severely limited the time I spent with my family? When this is all over, are we really going to go back to spending all our free time going here, there and everywhere, filling our hours with new diversions just because we can? Or do we actually prefer the simpler rhythms we've built of just being together in one place, of having longer and better conversations with parents and grandparents and long lost friends we haven't spoken to for ages? When this is all over, will the simple acts of kindness we've exchanged with neighbours turn into connections? Or will we revert to an awkward wave now and then? When this is all over, will my relationship with church friends carry on growing or will the intimacy and the mutual responsibility that seems to have sprung up these past few weeks just fizzle out? Will I remember that the lonely, isolated person I'm looking out for now was lonely and isolated before and still will be when this is over? And if I have given more time in this season to prayer, and to dwelling on the Word of God, will I, can I realistically continue in this discipline when this is all over? Surely we can't return to normal because the normal that we had was precisely the problem. Every year on Palm Sunday we remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the crowds hailing him as King. Every year we, we give out palm crosses to remind ourselves that this journey Jesus takes will lead to his death. And we pray for the Spirit to help us to mark and make that journey with Jesus this coming week. And we pray for the power of the cross to make its mark on us, even as we know the joy that awaits us on Easter Sunday. So on Palm Sunday in the year 2020, what does this king on a donkey have to say about the deep yearning we find in ourselves for real and lasting change? What we find is that this is precisely the question that Jesus addresses through the Palm Sunday story. This is a message of hope for us because it tells of his ability as king of all things to bring about the change we so desperately want but are powerless to effect ourselves. And the first truth we cling to in the story is a familiar and comforting truth, that Jesus comes to us as a gentle king. Verse 5 says this, Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. Look, it says, your king comes to you, gentle. What does it mean to say that Jesus is gentle? To the people of his day, gentle Jesus stood in contrast to the oppressive and sometimes brutal hand of the Roman occupiers and in contrast to the burdensome and demanding rule of Jewish religious leaders. In contrast, gentle Jesus healed at a touch or a word. Jesus ministered to the crowds that followed him even though he was exhausted himself. This is the Jesus who says, Come, all you who labour and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. This is the Jesus who fixes his gaze on every person who comes to him and bestows upon them great worth by asking, What do you want me to do for you? Even though he knows exactly what the need is. In every encounter Jesus had on earth, he showed us what it means to be a gentle king. And his rule reflects his character. The kingdom he's coming to establish is one in which the weak will be made strong, in which the last will be first, and where every need brought to him in faith will be met. The gentle king is the one who doesn't need to ride on a war horse. The gentle king is the one who can afford to ride the steed of a servant because he has nothing to prove. The donkey only highlights his effectiveness as a ruler, his incomparable ability to win hearts and minds. His power, Jesus' power, is self-evident. He doesn't need a horse or any other trapping of earthly kings to convince us. 
And this king says to us today, if you want to live under my gentle rule, if you want to be free from the world's creed of aggressive self-empowerment, if you want to be satisfied just being still and not rush about for fear of missing out, if you want to sit at my feet like Mary and not stress like Martha, if you want the gentler, more compassionate and generous spirit of these days to remain in you as a real and lasting change, then come, ride with me. The second truth from the story, Jesus is the gentle king, but we shouldn't for a moment confuse that with any idea of him being modest or self-effacing. I think in the past I may have assumed that Jesus was a bit embarrassed to be placed on a donkey and to be lauded by the crowds waving their palms and spreading their cloaks. After all, isn't this the Jesus who slipped away when the people tried to make him king before? Isn't this the Jesus who told those who healed to keep it a secret? But it's clear from the story that Jesus was not at all embarrassed or put out. On the contrary, the first six verses are a detailed account of Jesus giving precise instructions to two disciples on how to obtain the donkey and the colt. This is where you'll find them, this is what you'll do, this is what you'll say if someone questions you. In other words, Jesus meant for this event to happen exactly the way it did. We could even say he orchestrated the whole thing. From the procuring of the animals to the turnout of the crowds, these were residents of Bethpage and the neighbouring village of Bethany, the home of Mary and Martha, and where Jesus, by John's account, had recently raised Lazarus from the dead. Having seen that, the crowd turning up was guaranteed. Hosanna and praise to the one who saves, they cry. This heartfelt enthusiasm for Jesus was stirred by something they had seen for themselves. And it was so vocal that by the time they got to Jerusalem, verse 10, we told the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Jesus may be the gentle king and the one who comes to serve, but he is also the provocative king, the one who orchestrated this event, so we could be left in no doubt about who he is. This ride into Jerusalem is his throwing down the gauntlet to all earthly powers and authorities, to the Jewish religious establishment, to the ruling Roman occupiers, and to every individual observing these events, friend or foe, disciple or spectator. I am the King, Jesus says, and I am the promised Son of David, the ultimate, final Messiah King you were all waiting for. And in making that claim, Jesus knew exactly what was at stake. He would either be crowned as King, or he would be rejected and killed. He left no other option. He will not deign to live among us as the prophet from Nazareth, or a wise rabbi, or as a moral compass. I am the king, he says, and I offer you life in my kingdom, under my rule, under my control, under my authority. The gentle king is also the provocative king. And if today you've come to the same conclusion as the Apostle Paul, that I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't do it, if today you indeed want to be the change you want to see in the world, but you can't change yourself, then Jesus says, my offer is still good. You can't change yourself, but I can change you by my spirit living in you to be more like me in the world. Jesus, the gentle king who rules with complete compassion, with all-seeing understanding, the provocative king who says, my power, that gentle power you so long for, that power that is so not of this world, that power can only be made perfect in your weakness. My power can only work in you if you acknowledge that you can't do it and you submit to me as king. If you want my power and my kingship as the real and lasting change in your life, then come, ride with me. Finally, Jesus can say that to us. He can say, ride with me because he is the king who is still riding, he is still journeying. Look, your king comes, present tense. 
His journey of claiming and establishing his kingdom hasn't ended yet. Along the way, each person that comes to him in full submission is a victory over which we're told the angels in heaven rejoice. But the kingdom is more than individual human beings coming into it. It is an overhaul of the whole of creation. It's a new heaven and the new earth that will come at the end of Jesus' journey. And he will reign over that new heaven and that new earth. And we're told we will reign with him. The changes we want to see beyond ourselves in nations and in governments, the changes we want to see for justice, for peace, for equal opportunity, these are good and noble causes that should be part of our Christian mission in the world. But as Christians, we are also, also told that our primary mission is to go and make disciples of all nations to, as a church, convince the world by living out the change that Jesus has made in us, by together living our transformed life. History shows and human nature shows that we cannot, by our own intellect or by our own ingenuity, change the world. For all our good intentions, we cannot heal creation. Only Jesus, only God can do that. But today, in this time, he has given us a season to make a choice to be on his side. Or if we have already made that choice, to make a new commitment. Do we want that gentle, powerful rule in our lives? And if so, are we willing to submit or resubmit our whole lives to the king who promises to give it? I look at that photo of the graffiti on that wall and I imagine Jesus riding along that road. He reads the words, we can't return to normal because the more normal that we had was precisely the problem. We can't go back because that's not how life is supposed to be. And I imagine Jesus saying, we hear you and we've been telling you that since the fall, since the flood, since the covenant, all through the wilderness years, through spirit-filled kings and prophets, through my coming to earth to be among you. And when you look at the cross on Good Friday, you will hear me tell you again, you don't have to return to the way things were. You don't have to go back to the old life. I have made an escape. I have made a way out. I can change you. I am changing the world. Life can be different. Don't turn back. Come, ride with me. <laughs>